My grandmother had the benefit of education in Newport, Vermont, and in 1926 was the first member of her family, the youngest and a girl of a Vermont farm family in Newport, Vermont, to go to college when she went to Boston University. And I am now raising my family in the farmhouse that I grew up in. And next fall, my oldest son, Judson, will be attending Hartland Elementary School. We have always been at our best in Vermont when we were an innovation state. And our long-standing commitment to education in Vermont, whether it was our small, innovative, one-room schoolhouses to the jewel of our higher education, here and in other parts of the state. We were focused on making sure that everyone had an equal opportunity because of the education and the knowledge that they were providing. But we also had a fundamental understanding that education didn't end with the walls of a school. And in fact, our greatest innovator in education, John Dewey, was the one who said that education is not preparation for life. Education is life itself. And so we were the first to break down those barriers, to understand that education happened on the farm, in the woods, happened on the factory floor, happened in the soup kitchens, and happened in the trips that some people were able to make, either across the state or across the world. Providing an extraordinary education for the next generation requires focusing our resources on students, looking for a clear return on investment with every tax dollar we spend, and one that engages students in the kinds of activities and skills that will prepare them for this coming century. We are today, however, facing a number of challenges that were articulated by the other panelists here tonight. The number of students in Vermont are going down, and as a result, the cost of education per pupil is going up dramatically just to be able to provide the same education, much less a better one. There is disparity in access to information. For some families have access to broadband and a computer at home, and some do not. When electricity was talked about as to whether we could bring electricity to the last mile, it was George Aiken who said, there is a difference in the families where a child after chores, when it gets dark in the winter, can read at night, and those who cannot. Access to information on the internet is the equivalent today to the ability to read a book by electricity versus having to catch up in the short hours during our long winters. One in five young people drop out in Vermont we have the highest per capita debt of any graduating class in the country from college. And today, issues that were not an issue, that were not a problem that long ago, of drugs and dealing with the complexities of diversity are upon us, and we have to grapple with it. But there's also a fundamental change in the purpose of education that's happened. And we have to make sure that we grasp that as we look to the changes for the future. It used to be that most of the time in education, at least K through eight, was actually imparting information. People memorizing things. The source of information for young people either came from that teacher, from their parents, or from the small library they had in their school or the center of town. Today, access to information is everywhere. The access to the world's information, the access to the world's books is at fingertips. And in fact, it's usually young people, frequently under the age of 10, who figure out how to access that information faster than we do. And the way that people communicate has changed as well. I had a wonderful example of a teacher in the Northeast Kingdom who had this great assignment where she asked her class to look at some resources about a scientist and how that scientist, and they all had different scientists, would address an environmental problem that was facing the country. And they were supposed to come back and present, and her top student came back the next morning and started presenting, and her presentation was wrong. It wasn't the description or the theory that was on the resource that she had given her. And so she stopped her and said, Rachel, where did you get that information? It's not right. She said, well, 
I looked up the scientist, and Dr. Stein's email was online, so I emailed him the question, and this is what he sent back. And by the way, he's no longer at Oxford, he's at Harvard now. Now, that's a fascinating example, because it was a great assignment, but it fundamentally misunderstood how information and the processing of information can happen now in this particular era. Now, there are exciting developments and there are serious challenges. And you will hear me talk about technology a fair bit, you already have, um, because that's the world that I work in. I currently work for Google, I helped start a software company. My charge when I headed up AmeriCorps Vista was to help bring uh, AmeriCorps Vista, a 35-year-old program, online into the next century. But I want to make it very clear right now what my mother taught me, among others, which is there is nothing more important to a quality education than an excellent teacher. Let me say that again. All the technology in the world does not matter if you don't have a superb educator and a leader who attracts superb educators to use that technology to its greatest purpose. So when we're looking at the challenges that we are facing, and we understand that our greatest asset is our teachers, we must first look at the highest return on investment we can get for our tax dollars. And I will say right now that the way to do that is to not beat down teachers and make them feel like they're the enemy of the state, and it is not to make communities who choose to invest more and spend more on their schools to vote twice to be able to do so. To get a higher return on investment, we do need to reduce costs. I believe that we can cut the number of supervisory unions and superintendents at least by half. It's no offense to the hardworking superintendents. We're down to 92,000 people. We do not need 61 superintendents. And we have the opportunity as we consolidate to be able to share and to work across schools to do things like bulk purchase food, uh, food and fuel all the way through to sharing teachers and to collaborating on education across those areas. The second is we need to use distance learning so that teachers are able to provide a curriculum and we can move teachers to different schools while having real-time connection to the students that are in those other schools and potentially actually expand the amount of education. We also need to tackle health care costs, which is driving so much of school budgets, and we can talk about that at another time. But we have to do it. We have to do it soon. The second is um, a good return on investment is you need good investments. The number one best investment is early education. We know that, in fact, right now, we invest the most money at the time when it does the least good in education and the least amount of money when it would do the most good. With only 5,000 children between the age of two and four in this state, we can reach out to foundations, and schools and institutions like UVM and say, let's do that demonstration project. Let's show that quality early education can make a difference in the lives of those young people and in bending the cost curve of special education. Something that all the research shows and we can do at an extraordinary level in the nation. The other part is that we need to be able to measure that return. And we need to have accountability. The first is that we need to have measurement that is meaningful. And all the educators know that when you compare one third grade class test scores to a different third grade class test scores, you don't know about how students are doing and improving. And that was the fundamental flaw in No Child Left Behind. With a statewide student electronic record, we can actually track students' performance, empower teachers with information, and not lose students who move from one school district to another when they're never transferred the information and the strategies that are with them. And eventually, we can actually make tailored programs for those students. 